It'll be a very simple, simple affair. We'll start at 7, we'll go down, hopefully wrap up at 9. And uh, we'll start with the, uh, there's a random seating over here. There's only one mic, and then there's a mic for the uh, questions from the public up there. So after I finish my preamble, I'll have the mic to the candidates, and they can pass it amongst themselves. And if I have to say anything, I'll try to tell you. Um, we're we're going to have opening statements, and we're asking you to keep it to about two minutes, if you can. <laughs>
And, and I, I'd like to see more of a bridge to that next step. We have to look at high school graduation and understand that a modern economy is going to demand a bit more from you. And one of the things I would like to focus on, and, and, and understand we have a wide range of duties here, but one of the things I would really like to focus on is that transition to the next step. I think we can do a better job. I was talking with the dean of our business school about dual credit courses, courses that we could send an instructor to teach in high school that would be credit for both high school and university. Those are the sorts of conversations that we need to have to really to have our young people understand that this is, this is a step, there's, there's, there's more to learn, there's more to acquire, and we owe it to our future leaders in this community, our future leaders in this country, to ensure that our students are the best prepared that they can possibly be. Good evening, everyone, and uh, is, that, is that good? Too close? Uh, my name is Robin Capers. Um, I've got seven years of elected experience as one of your city councillors. Um, a few things that I'd like to mention uh, right off the hop. So, one of my inspirations for running for school trustees, my grandfather, he was a school trustee from 1955 until he died in 1983 for 28 years. And uh, a story that, uh, that I'm really fond of my grandfather was, and uh, speaking of technology, in uh, the late 70s, when Basically, computers were nothing more than glorified calculators. Um, there was a discussion about uh, purchasing, uh, purchasing the, basically the first computer for the school board, and the school board voted against it because I don't know, maybe they thought it was a passing fad that didn't really catch on. But my uh, grandfather Henry Groom, he uh, bought the first computer for SD73, or wasn't SD73 at the time, but he bought the first computer for the school board with his own. I think that's the kind of vision that we are lacking at the school board these days. We need to have people that are really invested and want the um, education system to be provided with the resources it needs. Had I been on the school board this past term, when the Vancouver School District basically stood up and said, we are not passing a balanced budget because education is under funding our costs, I would have been the first one in camp school board to stand up and say, we need to stand with the Vancouver School Board. We have a new provincial government that's much more amenable to funding education as it should be, but we need to make sure, because the bar is so low, that they're not only rising that bar a little bit, it needs to go up a lot. So I want to be an advocate for the school system, and I think I have the passion and the um, track record of accomplishing big things for our community. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, my name is Adam Jensen. I'd like to start by recognizing that we are um, today on the unceded territory, this discredited people. Um, I believe that's important as coming off the festivities on this weekend. I hope everybody enjoyed them as much as I did. Uh, moving on, I am running because I've been a part of this committee, community for 33 years. I was born and raised here. We have three generations of Jensen's that lived here. And I really believe in advocating for the community, creating strong conversations, and creating new solutions. So what that means is that we've worked with administrations, PACs, parents, students, and uh, we're friends with government so we can provide funding for our kids because they're important and they should be important to everyone. I don't have kids myself, but that's another reason I stand here today because I do believe that these are issues that should be important to every taxpayer. Almost as much as potholes. The kids should be maybe more important than potholes. And I think everybody needs to get informed about these excellent candidates that are out there and make informed decisions on the 20th. I uh, would also like to recognize that um, the, 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 to me, it's more than just two meetings a month for public speaking and graduations with kids. It's making those connections with that community, those students in the classrooms, those teachers in, in the, in, within the school system, so that we can come up with those creative ideas to move forward. We have an opportunity with collective bargaining coming up um, next year to walk into it with a new, new, new ability to create change because there's provincial funding that's possibly going to be allocated. And we need to fight for that in our district. And I want to work with those provincial representatives like Rob Funding and Carol James so that we can work together and move, move together on those issues. And with that, I'd like to pass the word to Joe. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming. I wasn't really expecting such a, a large group. And thank you, Kathleen, for organizing this. I'm running for re-election in the upcoming civic election. I'm presently completing my, completing my first four-year term as a trustee. I was elected in 2014. I bring to the board table a wealth of educational experience, as my entire career has been in, in education. 18 years as an intermediate teachers, which stretched over two provinces and three school districts and 17 years as an elementary school principal here in Cabinets at five different schools. Well, actually four, because I was a vice principal of Park West, so Park West for one year and four schools for the remaining 16, and now four years as a school trustee. You've been told over the course of uh, the last couple of minutes that continuing our push for provincial government funding to give our our right portion of the capital is the allocated each year so that we can address the overcrowding of several of our schools is front and center. You've also been told that the implementation of the district's five-year plan is a major focus, and I agree with both of these. I believe they are very important, and as a trustee, I will continue to work towards ensuring success in both. Saying that, I also have an immediate issue that I would like to address. And that is the image of the school board in the eyes of the public and the employee groups. Decisions have been made in the past that are contrary to what the views of the voters have told us they would like to see happen. When important decisions are made and we seek input from the public and our employee groups, the board needs to base a decision on that input. And I don't believe this to be done. If elected, I will continue, as I did in my first term, to represent your voice when it comes to decisions that affect the education of our young people. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Pierre Bosser. Uh, I was born and raised in Switzerland. I'm a certified uh, chef and pastry chef. I came to Canada in 1989, and I've lived in Canada since 2002. My daughter went to David Thompson Elementary School and uh, Westside High School. She got a journalism degree from TIU, and she lives in Berlin right now, working as a copy editor. Very proud of her. Um, I'm also the treasurer of the Downtown Neighborhood Association and the chair of uh, 78 Units Startup Corporation. 
our public school system is uh, one of the most important pillars of our society, and we must take care of it. We must clean it as that. There are many challenges, but we have there's also solutions to those challenges. But in order to, to tackle those challenges and implement those solutions, I believe we need a new breath, a, a new breath of air in the uh, uh, of education. Well, I have, I have a few points I want to make. Uh, one of my most important things is to protect the public and the public school system. So, when you contractors advertising private companies out there, it's a public space, it should stay public. Um, another point I want to make, the uh, demanding the appropriate funding. The school district is supposed to do a job. I think it's the duty of the provincial government to provide the resources that we can do our work. I like to uh, regularly meet with teachers and students, support staff and the uh, parents and see what's actually happened in the school because um, I think what happens in the schools should guide what happens in the Board of Education, not the other way around. And uh, finally my goal is uh, I like to have a great school for all kids, no matter uh, if that's a poor or wealthy neighborhood, every kid deserves an awesome school. Uh, public education system uh, should create well-rounded, well, uh, confident, um, sorry, <laughs> independent thinking citizens and no future workers. That's my and that all will guide me on whatever position I would like for the school work. Thank you.
because it took such a special person to actually be in that role and excel in that role. I think that I don't sort of have the list of things that I think I can say need to be fixed. I think a lot of those we've already talked about. Capital funding is always going to be an issue. We have issues with overcrowding. We have issues with um, different needs in the school systems that, that really are not being met right now. And my goal in all of this in terms of running is to be a person who represents the community, but to support our teachers, our support staff, to be everyone involved in making our children's experience what it should be in schools. And our children really are the ones who um, are the most important part of this whole process. John, you talked about the magnitude of the budget and things like that. I mean, it's huge when you look at the responsibility that we're entrusted with, and that's where I see that word trust as being so important. The job that we are having, or that we're asking you to give us, is the one of trust. If we break that trust, then I think that we probably need to look elsewhere. But I can stand here and say that it is my goal to look into this with a lens of an individual who's worked for 22 years in the community with mental health and substance use. I have coached numerous youth teams, uh, volleyball, basketball, soccer. I spent a lot of time with kids. I spent a lot of time with um, teachers and administrators in the course of my life. I believe very much in the fine arts, and I want to see those things continue. So I think that I can bring a lens that would be helpful to that table. Not wanting to reinvent the wheel, not wanting to start over and find a new six point strategic plan, but moving on with what has already been laid out for us. Thank you. I'm Kathleen Karpa. I've been a school trustee for 10 years. I have three kids in this district, and so I'm very invested in the success that our schools have because my kids will be in this district for quite a long time more. My youngest is only grade three. I want to make sure that all children have the opportunity to succeed in schools. I'm the trustee liaison for most of the North Shore and Rock schools. And I see firsthand when I walk into those schools the effect of the decisions that we make as a board. Are there happy? is one of my schools. Last year, Rotary Clubs were very generous in starting off the Starfish Backpack Program. And there were only 20 backpacks. And I can remember the principal telling me how desperately the parents were to make sure that those kids got their backpacks when one of them had been ill and was at school and how they pick it up and how much it meant to that family. This year, there's 120 backpacks, and most of them are going to my schools. And I know the impact that that has. I know what the impact of not having technology in the school means. I know firsthand, when I walk into those schools, what it means when there isn't somebody there to support some of our Syrian refugee families. When we have to have teachers rely on Google Translate, that means that we have to have technology in our schools. And it's up to us as a board to make sure that we have those in place. And that means meeting students where they are. Realizing that some students are going to need more help than other students and having the flexibility in the district to do that. It means that we have to be innovative and we have to be clever and we have to be empathetic about where our students are at. Thank you. Um, into different um, facets. And so my purpose in saying all this is to say, 
you know, we all draw parallels from, from various aspects of our lives. My vision for uh, Trustee is to continue to enhance all the schools across School District 73. We're working in partnership with the team here. Um, I started tonight on a bit of a left foot. Um, there is a uh, council for Ukraine and Chase, where Chase is one of my main um, areas as well, under representation. But you know, there are choices to be made. And realizing that there are conflicts that will occur in any scheduling event, and being a public figure, those are just the realities. But my reason for being here is to hear what, what my future team may have to say, just as you folks are here to hear what we also have to say about being trustee. And so my goal is to make all communities in my area and, and in all of School District 73 great places to live and learn. My experience of our school in Sun Peaks is that it's a glue that really holds the foundation of the community together. There are so many new families and places joining our community, and that means growth. Growth from a community perspective, growth from all, all sorts of perspectives. And one last thing that I'd like to say about my vision is to strengthen the First Nations education within the public school system. I believe we live on a beautiful land, and that land also has much to teach our children. Thank you.
So there's, a, are we have a new official community, community plan. It calls for gentrification of the downtown. How many families are going to move downtown when there's no neighborhood school? I, I would never consider it. So there's this disconnect. And I'm sure it goes both ways, where the city has projected growth areas, such as Orchard's Walk, when there's, still ma there's already massive pressures on Valley Secondary. So I want to be an ongoing conduit. We have uh, on, on paper that we want to meet twice per year. I think the school board and the city hall met three times over the last four year term. And so the, the disconnect is, is way too fast, and I want to try to bridge that gap. Well, thank you very much for the question, Chris. It, you point to engagement, and I think that's why all that people need to understand what the app is in the system or not. My children have since graduated from uh, the public school system, they're in post secondary, they're gone now. <coughs> uh, and, and when I look at uh, education, it doesn't matter if I get to the system today or not, or you've never had children. Uh, your future depends on a strong public education system. The nurse is going to care of you, the person who's going to you know, attend to your children, the person who's going to provide medical care to you and your family. It all hinges on a strong and robust public education system. When I was on board chair in, in a previous life, uh, a number of years ago, I published a column every week back when we had newspapers. Remember newspapers? Uh, and that uh, council was just kind enough to publish a school trustee column on a weekly basis. So for three years every week, more or less, I published a column. And when I was on city council for a number of years, I published a weekly column. And I think we need to engage the public, educate them, have them understand that schools are important, not just for um, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for the question about public engagement. Um, I can speak for myself um, in public engagement. Uh, I was vice chair as we were putting together um, a strategic plan. Um, we had over 70 meetings with different um, stakeholders for input um, into the new strategic plan. Yes, there are two pillars within the new strategic plan that, that speak to us um, paying more attention um, to our sustainable resources, one of those being partnerships, of course, and for us um, to create better partnerships um, so that we can all lead, um, learn, and work together. For me, from a place of public engagement, um, I will be in a school or an administrative office or at some public function um, that is related or at times not even related to the school district just to be out there to talk about it. Um, there's usually typically two on my calendar. Just recently, um, we had a new opening at the art gallery, and um, our children's choir, our children's honor choir, was there singing an original song. I made myself available on the Saturday uh, Saturday evening to do that. Um, when it did come to the can plan that the city has done, we were on the list to meet with them. At that time, um, Chair Denise Herbert and myself, as vice chair, approached the city and said, "I think you need to talk to us." When to your CAM plan. Um, we did have discussions around the densification. Um, we highlighted the fact that during the plan was there anything about daycare. Because they don't come to us until kindergarten. And so when you do start building that plan, you need to start considering your neighborhoods, not only the schools, but you also need to be considering uh, the daycares. Um, in the past two years, we have had three meetings with the city. Um, we have continued and growing our meetings with the Board of Governors at True. We know as a board, and I know specifically as the board chair, that that's a huge job that we need to do um, to reach out. But more importantly, we need to reach out and do it more publicly. Because, yes, John, I remember the days where we used to be able to write columns, too. Thank you. One of the fun aspects of being a trustee is getting out and going to the schools and going to the activities that happen at the school. In fact, just uh, last week or a week, two weeks ago, I had the privilege of watching the principal at Westmount Elementary get a pie in the face at the start of the Terry Fox run. When I first got elected in 2014, I sat down with the staff at Westmount and we talked about one of the things that they really wanted, which was a set of stairs that lead down to the soccer field. This summer, it got built four years out, but we got it done. I enjoy getting out there and, and meeting with the teachers and, and enjoying the, watching the activities that the students are putting on. That's such an important part of our job. And I hope that answers this question. Um, 
I lived down in this side in uh, 2006, and it was this uh, elementary school. There was a public consultation as well at that school. I was there actually, and uh, the public said, keep the school open, we can leave that day for a few years. And it was the same situation there as with Simpkins or uh, Stuart The decision was already made. So this, uh, really, in my opinion, there's not much point of having a public consultation if you make the decisions, decisions before that. And it's just an exercise in public consultation. And that is not acceptable. The Stuart Wood thing here, I believe <coughs> the city school board, nobody had any interest ever to keep that school open. And whenever somebody came up with an idea of how to keep it open, what to put into it, it was always you get 16 days. Nobody ever came out and said, yeah, that's good, let's find a way to do it. And that's the attitude for that has to change. It doesn't really matter for the public if that's, if the city is involved or the school district is involved or whose jurisdiction it is, what we need is a elementary school. It has to be done. That's that's the point we have to make. That's what we have to achieve. Thank you.
ideas to build on the, on the cultural heritage of this area. And so in doing so, um, you know, you do that by getting out and speaking to the people, speaking to the community people, understanding, you know, the history. Um, that is really what is going to inform my vision, my, my decision making, you know, in collective and sitting at the board uh, table. And so there's a couple things that work very well that enable anything to succeed when it comes to a decision making process or policy at that. And that's a strong process and communication. And so public engagement, communication is key. And so in keeping those two, two elements um, front and center, whether in my professional life, my public life, or perhaps as a, as a public figure, a communication will be a strong feature of, of, of the way in which I direct myself. I will have to be in many places at once, and I'll just have to strategize on how best to, to deal with that in collaboration with the team. Thank you. I think one of the things that the others can talk about is disconnect. So for myself, I went to the DPAC meeting. When I went there, there was nobody else there except for myself, the DPAC, and three representatives from the school board. While I was there, they told me, and everybody that was there, that there was a disconnect between them, the principals, our council, our mayor, and they asked about how we can fix that. I think the biggest thing is, we need to show up. We need to have parents come out and get involved in the schools. The DPAC mentioned that they're having troubles getting parents to come out to their PAC meetings. We need parents to come out and get involved. Right now, I can see a bunch of our candidates running for council, mayoral, coming out and supporting trustees. We need that as well. We need to bridge the gap. We need to work together. So thank you again, Chris, for your question. Uh, and to tackle um, specialized schools like Sewer Board in the future, I'd like to really take a close look at uh, capture measures and enrollment so we can have informed proposals to deal with those types of things with the provincial government. We need to talk to the PACs, we need to talk to the administration, we need to talk to teachers so that they're all informed and they're all educated on those proposals so that we can go to grassroots movements so that more voices come forward with those ideas and get involved within their communities to make those changes. That's what I suppose. Sorry, so yeah, I'll make this quick, I guess. Back to the original question, is that how do we engage people to be more involved in school and in public consultation? And I think for me, the biggest thing that stands out is education. How do we get people interested in what we're doing? And um, like, like John said, and like Kenneth said, is that uh, it's not just about uh, whether you have a student in the school. Uh, it's all one, we're all one community, right? And it's, uh, it's so important to get people educated so they know exactly what goes on. If you start throwing our numbers like three quarters of a billion dollars, that gets people's attention. And it's more than just the finances, but just really what the impact has on the economy, on the community, and everything that goes on with the school district. And you know, one thing that I've always had the idea of as a, as a trustee of elected was nights that meet the parent nights, instead of trying to get, um, or meet the teacher nights, sorry, instead of trying to get the teachers and parents to come to you, go to them. And every time we have a meet the parent or meet the teacher night, we go there and allow um, parents and students to actually meet the trustee that's responsible for that school. Now I know it's conflict from um, schedule and it's a lot harder than it sounds maybe, but I'm really going to go into the source of trying to educate people on, that, on what we do. So, thank you. That was a, a lot of, of, of long uh, answers. I think one of the things is the executive decision here. Not to start typically, but uh, I can kind of follow up on minute, but it's one minute, just so I know I get past it in this time, but I'm not sure another question, but yeah, that, that's quite a lot. I'll just say one minute and I'll just wrap it up then. It'll be into uh, authoritative. Um, also, John and others, uh, you can read a call from counselors and school trustees every month at CanvasThisWeek at CanvasThisWeek.com, just in case you forgot. Next question. <laughs>
However, the board voted against it and returned to one week's spring break. So this question is for the incumbent. Can you tell us how you voted and why you voted that way? Um, the motion that went before the board, board recognized uh, that um, a slight majority of uh, parents and a large majority of the teachers were looking for a two week spring break. The motion of the board literally did agree with the two week spring break. The difference was the board chose to follow the path of best practices and labor relations and ask that it be negotiated within the contract and not attached to the memorandum of understanding. One of the reasons that the board did that is we are the only contract in the province locally where that contract dictates when spring break starts. And we have to start our spring break on the third Monday in March, irregardless of when Easter is or anything else. So when it would come to putting in a two week spring break, it would be much easier if it was part of a contract and it would also be easier if where appropriately we could move the start date slightly so that it could match up with spring break because then you would be trying to put in the minutes and there wouldn't be as many. So I really need to clarify that the board did not say no to a two week spring break. The board said we're going to follow best practices of labor relations, we're going to ask that it be negotiated in a contract. We have a new agreement um, that should be coming out in 2019 so that could be a point of negotiation under the new agreement. But the board did respond by saying yes, slight majority of parents did want the spring break, majority of teachers wanted it, and we wanted it handled as a best practice of labor relations, we wanted it negotiated. We also need the public to understand that when we do that, we also need to go back and we also need to talk to and include our KP workers, we need to include our principals and vice principals associations, we need to include um, our exam staff because it has impact on everybody and everybody needs to talk about what it means for them and their role in the school district for that to happen. Thank you for the question. I am voting for a two week spring break. A former educator, I know the value of a two week spring break. I know that long stretch from January, February, and March is very draining on teachers, on students, on QP workers. When we did the survey, contrary to what was just said, 90, over 95% of the QP workers surveyed said they also wanted a two week spring break. Over 95% of the teachers said they wanted a two week spring break, and over 60% of the parents that were given, uh, did the survey said they wanted a spring break. We received letters from people saying, Oh my God, what a great idea. I've got, I'm in a split family relationship. One of us can have one of our kids each week. Like have our kids one week and then the other parent can have it the second week. We received letters from a letter from the employees at the hospital that are on shift work who also told us the same thing. Did we agree on a one week spring break as a board? Move that this Board of Education approve a three-year calendar with an annual one-week spring break as posted and circulated on the district website for all district staff with exception of Sundays. The very final comment on the motion, should language that permits greater flexibility in the calendar such that a two-week spring break is achievable with no loss of instructional days from the approved calendar. That hindered any possible hope of negotiating a two week spring break with our unions because it meant opening up the calendar bucket on our calendar bookends. I voted for a two week spring break. The motion that I supported basically said that we were in favor of a two week spring break as long as we could negotiate it into the contract. The thing is, if you do a memo of understanding, you have to renew it every year, and then you have to go and negotiate with QB every year. And our QB staff, especially our hourly employees, like our educational assistants and our bus drivers, they're only employed for 10 months. So losing a week's worth of salary really isn't fair when they're at the lowest paid 
people in our district. So we wanted to make it fair for them. We have a lot of parents and a lot of people who complain about the number of days the kids are out of school, and so we wanted some flexibility so the school spring break could be scheduled with Easter. And that's what we were asking for. There's a lot of schools that um, do pro D days in other districts in the summer, right before school started, and there's no reason why we couldn't do it here as well, but the contract that we have locally prevents that. We wanted a little bit more flexibility around the timing of spring break so that we wouldn't lose days of kids in school. And I'm going to go back to those kids that are happy because those parents can't afford childcare. And if they have a choice between working and not working, they're going to work because they have to put food on the table. And that means those kids are at home alone. And that's not accepted. on the 
teachers if we have that early enrollment done so that we know the numbers so that we can be sending out our monthly letters to all of the families. That doesn't always happen, so it is a push we're going to continue to do that we've just started in this past year and really doing more advertising around our enrollment. Um, the other thing that I, I know that we're doing because we have a brand new website, uh, we're trying really, really hard to more effectively communicate. We are getting um, a parent app, so I think the sooner that we have um, parents from kindergarten kids that can start to be receiving information, I think the easier it goes for kindergarten kids. Um, and I don't know if the public realizes it unless you've just recently gone through this process. Um, some kids, some schools, um, do a graduated entry and it's longer in some schools um, than others. They do it based on the knowledge that they have and the kids that are coming in. Um, and I really agree with that process. So I'd like to start with saying that I totally agree that kindergarten teachers are very important and they need lasting members of their students. Actually, today I was fortunate enough to meet with a former kindergarten teacher of mine and remind her that she taught me that bees come before bees because my mouth was sexy. That stays with me today. And I think that's important for, I think that stands testament to all the good work that teachers do within our school system. So I won't just cut it for that. But I want to say that we can encourage our students the freedom to play so that they can make, they can learn from experience. So that we can encourage them to learn through their different learning types and styles. And to quote another favorite teacher, you might get back to Tessie and make mistakes. That was in the spur of Thank you. Well, I had the opportunity for 17 years to be able to be a school administrator and watch the, the enthusiasm and the look of wonder in the eyes of the kindergarten students when they entered into the school. I think one of the best things that we did was make kindergarten a full day rather than a half day. Kindergarten students are also great in the fact that for the climate of the school, because the older kids look at the kindergarten students when they walk into an assembly and go, wow, look at them. Like, they're just a wonderment at this new assembly get together. We, as far as getting the kindergarten kids ready for school, they're, I think they're already ready. They're just waiting to get through those doors. I know my granddaughter couldn't wait for school to start in September. But we have a strong start program, and we also have the daycares, which are working really hard at getting the kids prepared for group get assemblies and group activities. What? Well, it's perfect. <laughs> there we go. Start in every school. 
And that's where families are basically welcome to bring their little ones into a classroom-like setting, sort of, inside a school, so that they get familiar with that building, and they learn to work with groups, and they learn to share, and they have those experiences. And one of our challenges that's been on the School Trustees Association radar, and that's something that all the rest of these wonderful people are going to get to learn very quickly, the BCFTA, the BC School Trustees Association. That's something that's on our radar that we're talking to the provincial government about is making sure that the provincial government lets school districts allocate space in schools for the little tiny guys that haven't hit school yet, or the, the preschools, the daycares, the strong schools, and to have that space as part of what's expected to be in a school, not just classrooms. Thank you for the question about the kindergarten children. And I just wanted to speak from my own experience. My daughter's first day of kindergarten, I was a mess. She was not. And so what this question made me think of is that the greatest thing that I did for that day was to step back and give her the responsibility Give her the feeling of responsibility. She had gone to Strong Start programs with me. She had been engaged in different activities. And here I was trying to hang on. But when she was just fully ready, fully ready to walk through those doors. And just to touch, touch on a few of the items that were spoken um, uh, by um, uh, Megan and Adam, uh, just about the daycares, as well as, um, as the Strong Start programs. Um, Part of my, my vision for uh, trustees is to strengthen that, that connection between the daycares and the community schools. However, coming from an area where we are in a small community, space is uh, limited, those, those are the constraints that we're dealing with. And I speak to many small communities within the area, area four that I would represent. And so, just to bring it back to what I was speaking to about answering the question is again responsibility, creating the space for our children to feel responsible enough and old enough to enter into school. And I'll start with Joe in the middle. No, I'll just start with Joe. Yeah, I'll just start with Joe. Yeah, I'll 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 all four of them are not going to answer. Just, 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 just elementary, answers. Answers, elementary, middle, high school. Well, I can see. No, no, no. no. <laughs> what is it? Elementary. You don't want any other? What is it? Elementary. Elementary. I would say five. Eight. Middle. Seven.
elementary, zero to one. Uh, middle school, about a five. And then high school, about a nine. How many of you use technology in your jobs? What percentage of your job is technology? Retired? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next, next question. Thank you very much. Next question. Hi, my name is Suzanne Bo. I've taught in this school district for like two years. I managed here for 10 years, so it must have been the right profession for me. I've been happy doing it. The other day, somebody asked me, what, what is your legacy? What would you like to be remembered for? And they all said, music, because I did a lot of music. I've always done a lot of uh, Arts, I taught a lot um, using drama and so on and so forth. But I think that my kind of thing would, would be teaching food work. And there weren't very many. Um, Can you the question? There was, well, I would like some, you know, what, what your ideas are, or what, where you're coming from, from the fine arts. But, um, I think it's really even more important to teach children to work together as a group. And this person said, Suzanne, you should go to the parliament and teach those people how to <laughs> listen to one another and, and do a lot more group work. And so it's sort of a double whammy question. First of all, uh, what are your feelings on fine arts and how that's going in the schools? Um, I'm a little bit out of it now. Uh, I belong to the retired teachers now. Uh, and the other question is working in groups and uh, finding a mark for people to follow that's, that's a, on that. That's a lot of questions. Yes, yeah, sorry. Want to start with a fine arts one? Okay, a little bit on the fine arts. Let's start with this end of this one. Yeah. Okay, so fine arts. Thank you very much for coming. I'm retired. Coming from a community, again, where there's a uh, space constraints. There's constraints in um, you know, resources. Um, the, the things that we can focus on are always easy to focus on, but the things we don't have. What about the things that we do have? We have some wonderful teachers who have strength, who have who has theory, who has a degree in fine arts. Why don't we hold in on those? And that is exactly what our school is doing. We may not have the space, but we get creative. We go outside. You know, the teacher brings in instruments and they don't have to be big. I think we ordered drumsticks recently. Drums, drumsticks, and the children were going to get creative, and that was the way. And fine arts is an integral thing to have in schools. Um, the creativity that it brings, I think, is one of the cornerstones of what kids are going to need to succeed. I was um, really, really, um, in my first term as a trustee, very upset that we were losing music on the North Shore. It was very, very difficult to get music for the grade sevens on the North Shore. And I was overjoyed when, with the middle school, all of a sudden, every single grade seven that I wanted to had access to a music teacher. And I was just over the moon. And it shows with the music program that they have at Rock. And you know, I'm not Michelle, I would have probably embarrassed you. Um, but I was just overjoyed with that, and I think fine arts is an integral part of what should be in schools. Um, I am definitely in support of as many fine arts programs as we can maintain um, in the school system. I think that for children who have different ways of learning and different ways of um, having an opportunity to express themselves, different ways to succeed in areas of life, that if we limit those, or if those are lost because of cutbacks and things like that, we lose some uh, very important ways that we to learn and grow and express themselves. Uh, musical literacy and artistic literacy are uh, times and um, in many situations as important as academic literacy. So I think that's important, and, and I stand by that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my husband that's in the audience, he's been a music teacher for 18 years at Rock Middle School. So I am definitely a supporter of music and the arts. Um, I have a diploma in fine arts, I have a diploma in graphic design. Um, our students and our kids have gone through KISM, Council to Assembly School of Music. 
Um, I've been to many performances that not only Rob Hill has done, but I've been to the school district honor band and honor choir. Um, these are really integral music programs that we need to have in our school. I used to go to like secondary school. I had an awesome teacher, Dwayne Love. Um, they no longer have a music program. I'm very disappointed in that. Um, Barrier as well lost their music program. They do not have a music teacher. So I think we really need to advocate about getting music in all of our schools. Thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, greatly in favor of arts programs. There's way more arts programs. Over the decades, I've concentrated way too much on, on just academics, and we lost all the uh, creative parts as well. Also, in arts programs, we do a lot of student led learning, which often is not, not possible within the academic programs. Uh, the one thing, of course, there is an arts program. My, my daughter went to uh, some music uh, program on the West Side. And uh, she actually had to rent the saxophone. And there's a big problem right there. Not everybody can afford that. So if we're going to have arts programs, they have to be fully funded. The equipment has to be there. The instruments have to be there. It has to be allowed to every child, no matter what uh, home, what, what income their uh, family has. Otherwise, uh, we're just building like an elite program. Right. What do we all have? on our fridges, posted on our bullet boards in our kitchens, or in, in a bedroom. It's artwork. It's artwork coming from the kids. They're constantly drawing, they're sculpturing, they sing. All of these things are extremely important. It allows the exploration of the mind. It allows creativity. And it takes, it, it's, it's an area in school that takes the pressure off of knowledge seeking because they are able to express themselves in our work. And on a final note, I myself am a musician. Why would I not want to have music in the schools? I play the violin. Thank you, Susan, for the question. And thank you for your years of service within the school system. I believe that art teaches more than just art itself. It's many transferable skills. Like you mentioned, it teaches group work. It teaches stress relief. And in this busy world, tomorrow with so much technology in our hands, we need those abilities to have something that, that we can walk away from our technology and do. That gives us that stress relief. And for the kids of tomorrow, they're going to need it even more, especially later in life. Um, I think it's important, too, with, with creativity in the future, it's going to be more and more of a demanding skill with the rise of AI. I think those creative um, thinkers are going to provide the solutions in science and then that manage the products like quantum computing. Without that creativity, there will never be the next answers. Thank you so much for that question, Susan. My whole time involved in education with I was on the board and I am a true, true supporter of the arts and all avenues of it. Um, I just, it opens up our kids' minds. It teaches them to take risks. It teaches them about what is possible. Um, today, my daughter started her first real professional career as a mechanical engineer. I graduated from Queens. Um, she always participated in the arts. In fact, she spent three years at the Canada School of the Arts for grades seven, eight, and nine. And even when she left, to pursue uh, more of the sciences at Norcam, she volunteered um, in the drama program because it meant so much to her. And to her, music is the purity of science. And that is what I too believe in. Even at a time uh, in this district when um, we had declining enrollment, we did everything we could to keep the arts in the schools. And right now, we need to do even more. But part of our problem is the music teachers, where we don't have lots of them, and we try hard to um, to attract them to the district. Um, but I know that the districts are struggling even more to get music teachers than we are. But the arts are always on their radar. Thanks, Susan, for the question. You deserve my life. Um, yeah, I think the arts are critical. I've actually had the good fortune of uh, shadowing Jenny Kalpa at the Council School of the Arts. I've done about 100 hours with her. She's an unbelievable music teacher. She's so modest, but um, it's seeing the students and when they, whether they're going to dance or it's unbelievable the amount of, you know, 
you can see the stress just like going off their shoulders when they have uh, the ability to express themselves and they have an outlet. So like Adam um, was saying about um, it just equipping people for the future, because you know, there's a lot of things to be depressed about in our world right now, but uh, it's, it's an amazing outlet to have those creative skills and have that, you know, and it comes to like emotional literacy and all that stuff that it's got me so excited to become a teacher, seeing what's possible and what's happening in schools, but at the same time, it all comes down our ability to do it and teachers are going out of pocket for resources and whether we we have to rebuild our relationship with the provincial government and we need to make sure that we have the resources to equip those teachers to do and uh, what they are so good at. But also it can't be just specialized schools, it has to be available to everyone. I'm going to resist the temptation to brag about my wonderfully talented wife, my wonderfully talented children. <laughs> To the fire. But you know, when I watch uh, any kid, my own kids, of course, and, and, and any child, I watch a kid playing something like one sounds or an orchestral trombone. And they're watching the conductor, they're staying in time, they're keeping a rhythm, they're moving their hand, they're flowing, they've got their armature going, and keeping in tune with them, with themselves and with the group around them. That's a lot of things. It's like juggling in the unicycle. There's a lot of things happening at once. That's an incredible skill. And I remember watching my, my children being adjudicated, and the adjudicator said something that, that always stuck to me. He said, you know, you're too young to know how hard this is, and I hate you. And <laughs> what I meant by that is just, you know, this is an incredible thing we're developing for kids when we give them that opportunity to engage in some sort of artistic expression. And it's not just about being a great musician, it's about being a great human being, feeling poised, they can speak in front of a group. I, I'm never more proud of my own kids when I see them speak in front of a group of people, and I say, wow, that they, they've got a poise and, and a sense to themselves that is just something you cannot replace in any other aspect of education. So. Thank you so much for your service and your question. Thank you. Yeah, for fine arts, um, you know, I was fortunate enough when I was younger to go through the Suzuki program and also um, you know, continue on other lessons. Uh, from piano, I hate it at the time, but now I have to say that was probably the greatest gift I ever had. Um, and even to this day, I wish I would have done more with it when I was younger. Um, but uh, fine arts are a huge part of what we do, um, uh, both culturally. Uh, and from the school, I think they to do it as much as we can with that. And my, my kids are in uh, Highland Dance, and to see them get out and dance with people, give them confidence, and um, be creative, and make mistakes, and learn from it, I think it's huge, and that's really what fine art provides for kids. Thank you. make sure there was an outdoor nature facility near all the schools, uh, for example, doing an interpretive nature park at MacArthur Island, and, like the Dufferin Wetland and Dufferin and Kent Park, right? that sort of thing. Thanks for the question, Jesse. Um, yeah, I think that um, there's a lot of natural partnerships between the city and the school district. Um, and, and I think that would be a great opportunity for the nature park, especially centrally located. Um, that is easy to access for all schools um, because transportation can be a barrier for, uh, uh, for field trips and that sort of thing. So I think it's a uh, little car for be a great location. I'll keep it brief. Maybe, maybe we'll yeah. that thing to come back to Sure. Um, we're open uh, to hearing from the parents, to hearing uh, from the city, and different partnerships that, was, that can be created um, around that right now uh, with the new it's all about experiential learning for students, and that comes in different environments. Um, so, group wants to come together and work with administration and work with the board. Um, I see lots of opportunities um, that we can have to support that fully um, with the core competencies, especially in the new Thank you for the question. I, I'd love to look at uh, nature parks being more available, but I'd also like to make sure that we have funding for um, trips like the uh, Adam River Salmon Run, which I was able to attend for two weekends in a row. And it makes, it brought me back to when I was a kid walking along those shores. Those memories stick with me for life. And I think it really does give you an empathy for the environment that's important to tomorrow. And if we start with the kids of today, it will, we're, we won't have these discussions that we have on the news of tomorrow, hopefully. 
First off, I'd like to mention that Jesse informed me that I was his grade four teacher at Park Crest. So I must be getting older. School District 73 is leads the way when it comes to outdoor education. We have Isabel Lake, we have McQueen Lake. And for us to, to work with the city, I'm also on Park and Rec with Jesse. And for us to work with the city and create more outdoor venues is, a, is an awesome idea. Because kids learn so much from when they're on field trips. And you just have to take a look at the, at the buzz on the bus when they're driving up to Isabel Lake or up to the Queen Lake and, and trekking around and dipping the nets in and scooping up the little tadpoles that are in the ponds. These type of things. And I know that the part where I live is really looking at a nature park, which will be fantastic, as well as the Dufferin Wetlands. And there's also the Aberdeen Island uh, uh, Park up there as well. So, again, SB 73, we are very focused on outdoor education. I'm very much in favor of having more nature parks. We get a lot of parks full of sports fields and and all that stuff. It's really nice just to work for everybody actually to have the space where you just put my help. Uh, it's important for the school as well. I'm also in my daughter actually on my green life when she was in the elementary school there. I spent a week up there. Um, that was an awesome time. That was a really great time. Great time for the kids. They get to do, uh, walk in, the, in a night walk in the snow and that kind of thing. The only problem on the side there is once again with the funding, there's no actually a few touch to it. Um, I'm pretty sure it's meant to just basically not afford this kind of thing. So these programs have to be absolutely of no cost to any kind of parents. And a lot of the politics, no matter what. Thank you. Um, for our family, our kids also got to do the Queen Lake, um, go and see the salmon. Those were a huge part of things that our kids got to do. We walk around Black Island all the time. Kids, our kids have played sports. I would like to see both. I would like to see where we can come together and have both, both the nature park and sports come together. I love to walk around and I see the deer there. I'd love to keep the deer coming back. I think we just need to put them both together and work together rather than just a nature park or a sports facility. Why not incorporate both? I'll make this very quick. Um, having an opportunity to have spent time as a child on Queen Lake and to also see my daughter spend time on Queen Lake as well, like, I think that um, the evidence uh, of the warmth of nature being a part of my life experience is written all over them <laughs> when they have the opportunity to be there and when they can hold those are the things that they talk about. Um, my daughter's got to age now where she sometimes walks begrudgingly, um, but she will do it um, at her school as a part of the family experience where you run along the way without question. And I think that that's something that's vital to the health and well-being of our, of our students as well, getting out of the classroom and into the um, world of nature. I think kids having access to nature is hugely important, especially as we become more and more urbanized and we lose touch with nature. And we get used to being just surrounded by concrete and black top. And we don't know how to go and just listen to the insects and the birds and to actually be able to observe and feel what's happening around us. And we get desensitized. And so I think it's critically important that our kids have access to natural areas. And so part of the beauty of collaborating and being engaged with our fellow communities um, and the community members, um, we realize the beauty of the land around us. We only need to drive out an hour, not even out of cameras, in each direction, any direction, to see how vast and beautiful this land truly is. And so I live full time in the There is a wondrous place there. We might not have a very built up formal playground of sorts, but there is a beautiful area that I want to come and enjoy. Just as there is in Chiefs, just as there are in between in Richard Pinatown, if you've ever taken a drive into any of those areas, all it takes is just to make the commitment to get outside. Through. I'll be very quick with this. Yeah, anything to do with nature and getting kids outside, away from you know, like I said, in zero to one, especially elementary school kids, anything away from um, overconsumption of technology. On a personal note, my kids maybe watch half an hour TV a week, and that's if they listen. I guess 
based on a very um, LSI reading that is a uh, new nature that, uh, that usually in favor of, and uh, I think it's so important for uh, new development. Where I teach at TRU, we have students from around the world. Some of them come here from cities with 20, 30 million inhabitants, and they're, they're blown away. Once I can get some, they won't be by a bear. Uh, they're, they're blown away by what we have to offer here. Of course, we need to harness that for our own kids, and sometimes I think we don't realize what we have in the backyard. And some fresh eyes from, from across the world, when they come here to look around at what we have, of course, we're going to have to incorporate that in the education we provide our kids, and it's an absolute gift that they're to you. All right, we have about 20, 20 minutes of closing, uh, closing comments. Are there any other questions? Yes. Um, getting into schools is really important. So to the incumbents, I'd like to know how many times in the past school year you were able to get into the schools that were, are assigned to you and um, you had conversations with staff and students and to the others. Uh, I know many of you were working full time, so how do you plan to get into your schools and have meaningful conversations with staff and students? Thank you. Okay, thanks. We'll start again and make it simple. Um, how do you plan to? And then how did you do that? Mm, many years of hard work and dedication, I spent years at the university finding what I thought would be the ideal career. The low and behold, I wasn't sure what that was until the last few years when I finally felt like I made it. And so I say this because I went to public school. I took the years of university that gave me the opportunity now to be flexible. And so I have two small children. I live in a remote community. I do drive a lot, but I don't mind it. And so part of my strategy, part of my vision right now, as I work towards connecting with the communities that I would be representing, is to truly get up and be with the people. Community events, um, whether or not you're invited or not, sometimes it's just a wonderful thing just to make an appearance and just to speak. And so that is, that is my vision. That is um, how I would approach my scheduling of time. I do work full time, but I'm able to work, I need to play at night to compensate for the time that I spend during the day. I think it would be really difficult for me to actually quantify how much time I spend in schools because I go whenever they ask me to come. Um, and I go when they don't ask me to come too. Um, so, I try to get into my schools as much as I can. Um, and I mean several times a year to those schools. And not just for um, congratulations, you've you know, been employed in the school district for 25 years to get things. I try to actually get in and walk around and visit all the classrooms. Um, I regularly, I see me down at Bird Edwards, it's not my school, but I'm actually there for Murder's um, Day. And I'll be out on the banks of the Thompson Rivers when it's down. I spent an entire day in Carver Hatton um, with their open house and visiting and talking to all the school students and parents at their open house. Uh, I was just recently uh, dropped into the street school. Um, I went in and my schools on a pretty consistent basis. Um, I am a permanent uh, full-time, I'm sorry, permanent part-time employee with the Interior Health uh, Mental Health and Substance Use. I have some uh, autonomy and flexibility in terms of when I can um, get away from the office or more move things around to be able to make other commitments and requirements that way. And I think it's really finding a balance between being able to um, be where you need to be and be able to prioritize. And the school uh, trustee position is something that I take incredibly seriously and that I will uh, prioritize that um, with the highest uh, regard for me to be there in the present. Thank you. Um, my profession is a resident carry, and a casual alcohol, so that definitely gives me flexibility. Um, as well, I think really getting out there and going to our PAC meetings, our team PAC meetings, I'm already out there talking to parents, I'm already visiting schools, I'm already attending school board meetings, I think we just really need to get out there, open the dialogue, talk to parents, talk to the teachers, talk to the children. Thank you. Um, 
Hustle Baker. Uh, I work the morning shift, so I usually my off the soap, and I'm also uh, at a point in my life where I don't work full time anymore. I work 30 hours a week, so there's some spare time, and that's why I'm also doing these things. So <coughs> uh, in this on this part of my life. Uh, what I actually like to do here is not actually going to talk to people. What I like to do is actually set up meeting in schools and have people talk to me. I like to see teachers and students and parents come in and just drop by on a regular schedule, maybe once every two weeks or once a week or something. For a couple of hours, everybody can drop by. They can tell me what's happening, what the problems are in the school, what's the, what is actually going on there. And uh, I'm interested to actually uh, take in taking notes of that and then bring that to the uh, Board of Education because I'm convinced that what actually what happens in school every day of your life is, in, is uh, what should be uh, getting the policies of the Board of Education. Next, let me ask a question. Have I got time? I'm retired. Have I been out to the schools? Yes. As like trustee uh, before me, um, I can't really come up with a, a definite answer. Some, some weeks I'm there out of schools three, four times. Other weeks I, I don't go at all. Um, I was recently at a Terry Fox run. I uh, was asked to MC at the, the West Side's uh, Centennial Park uh, cross country run. Due to the weather, it didn't happen. Um, I've been to Christmas concerts, I've been to assemblies, I've been to Patty. So I think I've sat down in staff rooms and actually enjoyed a cake with staff and a conversation. So I'm out there as much as I can. Do I do it as enough? Probably not. It would be something that I would look at in the, my next term? Definitely. But uh, it's very important to get out there and see the kids and talk to the teachers. Thank you for the question. Short answer is an eight time. The second longer answer is within the collective agreement of my employer, there is a clause for negotiated time off in regards to this type of position. I would also take vacation time. I work overtime and I have already put, taken off days to work on this campaign with my employer. So I am committed to doing those things. I believe this is very important, so it's, it's worth that time and money. Um, I'm a highly energetic person. I enjoy meeting people and I enjoy listening. So that's something I really like to bring to the table. Um, I can't quantify in the last year how much time I spent um, in my schools and in schools around this district. Um, I take road trips. Uh, I go into the rural areas. Um, second week in September, I spend the day driving all the way up to Bluebird and packing and visiting all the schools in North Thompson. Um, even though that's, that's not my area, I'm a county trustee, but as, as chair, I thought that is my responsibility to be out um, and not just when we have our meetings out in those rural areas. The other thing I need to tell you that I often go into the bus garage and I often go into the maintenance facility, you're going to find me at the end of the group, you're also going to find me at the board office because those are all integral parts and pieces that make an education system work. Um, so I spend a significant amount time talking to all the various people that make this system work and that we need to hear from because we are incredibly diversified. Um, but I think if you took my time on average and when I'm in the building talking directly to kids or people um, that we employ, uh, probably my school is in session minimum four hours a week. Thanks. Uh, we'll make a question. Um, so I can't quantify it um, because I've been shadowing um, as I work towards my uh, entry to education program. So I've done 150 hours in various schools over the past uh, four months, more as, a, <coughs> uh, as an observer. But I've definitely taken notes since I decided to run for school trustee. Um, over the past four months, I've visited uh, Dufferin Elementary, so it's a Halley County kind of School of the Arts. I've spoken in the last two grants for the grades of grants for Colony Joe, the French Virgin School. Um, South Calum Secondary, Valley Secondary, we did the intergroup center I played in the uh, year wrap up for Arthur Patton. They did a uh, hockey, and um, over the last years I've spoken at Westside Secondary, Marion Schilling, Jennifer Rich um, about municipal politics. 
And if I'm elected, I plan to continue to visit schools. And uh, if I'm elected, I just want to hear five voices. Thanks very much for the question. And I agree completely that it's important that trustees get out of schools. It's not something that people are going to do. Uh, in my role as TRU, I do go to high schools and speak to high school law classes primarily to talk about our students at the Abbott Trade, be it the law school, the business school, some of the business law courses that can take in TRU schools and business as well. I have a little presentation I give on human rights in the workplace so we understand what the workplace rights are. A lot of these kids are part of the point part time, so they should understand their human rights. And so we talk a little bit about what your employer can ask you to do, what your safety rights are. And so I, I've done that presentation this fall at uh, Valley and South Camp. And I'll get back up to West Side, and I'm hoping to expand that out to some of the other area schools as well, because it's part of about what I do at the university. It's been about reach, and obviously something that will continue as a school trust. So again, I, I, of course, I agree that it's very important that we go up and we reach out to students and teachers and faculty. Um, but you know, before you began this process of um, uh, this campaign, uh, I had to sit down with my wife, even though my kids like they're eight and five. I had to sit down with my if I win this, there's going to be days when I come late and nights when I'm out late, and this is going to be the way it is. So are you okay with that? And they said, yeah, because they, they agree that um, this is a very important role, and um, you know, as, as a family, we came to the conclusion that this is something that's um, it's a value. So, uh, you know, I've also changed careers that allows me more flexibility. Uh, the last 10 years, I've decided to keep it. I carry for manager role in cameras now, and what that's done for me is allows me to if I need to leave at 12 o'clock in the afternoon for the day, that's okay. I make my own schedule, so um, I base my career around this sort of position. Thank you. We have uh, probably time for one more question and answer, and then we're going to get into the closing uh, closing comments. So, thank you. Hello. Uh, as a woman in trades, who happily stumbled upon my career through a uh, school counselor. What would you like to see done to promote, to promote equality and diversity in male-dominated interests, such as STEM, trades, and shop electives? So, in my own career for Seth Peaks, I um, dealt a lot with the ITA, I was more on the operations side, and um, one thing that I'd like to see is have them more involved in the schools and have the presence. I think we still left a misconception that um, trades are male dominated Better, but I really like to see more of a presence in the schools and um, more information to um, some of the females letting know what the opportunities are and, and what's out there. Um, we see a lot of the hill, we had a lot of um, yes, uh, two females in particular who went into the NORAC program and they've gone on and have been very, very successful. And they, um, in my mind, are um, an example of what you can do as a female in trades. So I think it's very important to have representation in the school. I guess you trade science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM. And what's interesting though is that a lot of the soft skills that they were overlooked in organizations like Google are starting to realize that the most valuable employers are those who have those soft skills. My profession of law, we know that in the entrance, actually the majority of students are now women, as opposed to men in, in, in the field of law, which I think is a wonderful thing that we're, we're, we sort of achieved that gender balance in terms of the intakes in the law school, not professional generally as a whole, but they certainly moving in that direction. Our newest justice to our Supreme Court is a woman. No drama around that. That's a wonderful thing for, for, for us to have. But yes, of course, uh, girls can be just as good at science, technology, engineering, math, as anything else. Uh, we, we need to encourage a more gender balance across the board. And then, you know, what's to be carried? What's going to go into become nurses? And that's just that, that's, that's good as well. And the last day that I was uh, shadowing at Council School of the Arts, the the, the class champion of a multi-week uh, series tournament of a uh, race to 1,000 was a female student. And she was very proud, and so were her, uh, her female uh, classmates. But I, I think you know, um, there's things like the TRU uh, Women in Trades program that are creating opportunities for women, for women when they come out of high school, and it's also creating role models such as yourself for younger women that are thinking about trades. But I think it also goes both ways where we have to make sure that Boys are feeling comfortable to, you know, be singers, be dancers. The Campbell School of the Arts has been, been an amazing opportunity to see what happens when, when all children are allowed to fully express themselves, uh, regardless of gender. Thank you. Um, we are starting with the school system right now with new positions for the new career education curriculum that's coming up. Um, and from what I know, what I've seen, and I've talked to several more and more coordinators in our schools, um, it's a huge part of exploring every single option, regardless of gender.
gender is really become about what is your passion, what is your interest. And I think that's the best way to go for all of our kids. It's really about them, how they learn what they're passionate about. Now, when it does come to trades and stems, I'm the mom of a mechanical engineer, and she's a 22-year-old female. I believe really, really strongly in that um, for women. Um, that's where she went, that's what she wanted, and this school district helped her get there. Thanks for the question. I think the way we should promote these types of qualities within the system is to encourage women and girls to participate in programs where they get experience, the operational tools. I believe it's called heavy metal, like if you said that wrong, but where they have heavy metal rocks, they do some rocks. But heavy metal rocks actually gets the students out into the machineries where they're actually able to operate them. But I think if we encourage women to try those tools, then they find that they are an operator in heart, and that's a great career for them as well. Well, school districts. 73 is, has got uh, set in the way with uh, our NORCAM trace technology. And from everything that I know, um, it's open to both male and female. There is no case where we're, we're leaning towards the male student rather than the female student. It's basically their choice if they want to go into trades or not. And so I, I believe we're on the right path. We're heading in the right direction. I think the, uh, we have the school, trade schools, the trade programs as a great start, but we also have to see that the actual start is probably done in kindergarten level. We were talking about it, you have the kids very young, and um, the, there is the key that the resources there that gender doesn't really matter that much. Um, it matters what you want to do, what you put up, what you enjoy, and uh, I think kindergarten level, very, very young, that's where it starts, that's where you get an entirely new generation and an entirely new attitude through the school system. Thank you. Um, as Joe said, we do have the North Camp Trades program. They just um, built an extension of it to reuse their, their expanding their trades programs. I think it's important to have role models like yourself. Um, one of the things I noticed they have they have this master program and they travel to all our different schools. And one of the things they have in there is auto mechanics. So I think it's really important that we have positive female role models and that we utilize program by counts and master program and other programs available in count to encourage women to do training. Hi, I'm just gonna um, pick up sort of what you said about the that we really are students right now here. And, and when I talk about here and the importance of it and that idea of recognizing diversity and all of those things, I think that's a big part of tapping into who the student is for the minute when they walk through that door in terms of being um, given really a limitless experience in terms of what their exposure to different, uh, different elements of the world and what those have to offer. Maybe in terms of encouraging trades that we need to, I mean, it's, it's so much built into our society, and so I think that we're coming, as we often do, like with curriculum and stuff in our position, um, that it seems less now, like when you go into the rest of the buy anything from building blocks, you're either building a princess castle, or you're building, you know, um, uh, bought the builder side, or you're actually building something that boys would want to play with. It's very interesting, but I think those uh, gender types are starting to dissipate a bit. I think that you spoke of one word that I thought was really important, and that was counselor. You said that there was one who took enough of an interest and who got to know you enough to know what you wanted to do. That's where I think teachers and support staff need our support as trustees to continue to have the ability to do their job well and with the passion that they bring to it. Thank you. Um, I love your question. Um, and I think a couple of things. Um, our school district was recognized this past year by the ITA as having one of the highest participation rates in programs and products. So, you know, that's one for us. Um, second thing is um, the district principal who's in charge of our trades and transitions, we just changed her title, but she is in charge of that. So I think it, sh it helps by having a female at the top of that whole program. She's a role model herself. And the third thing is, um, when I look at um, grade seven, eight students, they're no longer doing 
foods or clothing for the girls, and then work and work for the boys. They get a mosaic and they do them all. And I think that's a really, really important step, is that everybody gets exposed to these things. And it's not gendered anymore. Thank you for your question. Um, I believe as a parent that um, we need to It's 
pretty big learning experience. And knowing that we are going to have at least three new people on the board, I think it's um, very valuable to have some more experienced trustees on the board, as well as having those new voices. Um, because sometimes those ideas that people have um, that we love to in implement, well, we have tried. Um, and maybe they didn't go as well as we'd like them to. Um, the other thing that I bring is my credential experience. I sit as the board's representative to the BCST Prevention Council. I'm very intimately involved in a lot of blogging at, uh, efforts that the BCST does. I currently am sitting on the uh, capital working group with the BCSTA, talking about the provincial wide need for capital dollars for new schools and repairs province wide. And I think that's an important thing to bring. And the fact that um, my kids are going to be in this system for another long time. My youngest is only grade three. I have a lot invested to make sure that um, this district is successful and this, that kids have a chance. And being in Brock and being on North Shore, I talk to a lot of families and a lot of the vulnerable families in Kamloops and I know what those concerns are. And those are the students that we focus on and trying to get our grad rate higher, are those kids that are the most vulnerable, and those are the ones that I have contact with on a weekly basis. Thank you. Um, I think what I can say is that I bring, uh, I bring enthusiasm, but I also bring um, a lot of uh, untapped, and un, un, uh, untapped um, knowledge that, uh, that I can bring to the table. I have had an opportunity, uh, obviously, to be a member of the uh, school board to date. I think it would be an absolute honor to be trusted with that responsibility. Um, I see our kids as really our greatest resource that we send for the school age years. We send them to school and oftentimes we don't see them as much in a day as the people who work in the schools do. The people who work in the schools, teachers, support staff, the environment there can often identify when our children are starting to struggle long before we do at home. Or maybe in ways that they get they those changes in social behavior, they those changes in hygiene, changes in homework, those kinds of things. Where we I think can support, and what I want to bring to the table, really support that relationship between parent, teacher, student, and like making sure that we integrate all of it and really have to be a triangle of trust. So that we're in a position to be able to help students when they're young, improve mental health outcomes, improve graduation outcomes, and therefore improving our society as a whole. Teachers can't do it without our support. I think that that's an important part of it. Um, and again, I am definitely but I'm not key experience. You will always get honest, uh, transparent answers from me, and I will be very uh, honored to move forward as a trustee of this program. Thank you, Heather. Um, team building, earning trust, accountability, transparency, uh, the ability to mediate, an important thing, listen. Make well informed decisions, create equal opportunities, whether it's fundraising for the PAC coordinating school ball jobs, volunteering in classrooms, or standing on the front lines with teachers. Education is always been a driving force in our family, and it will continue for years to come. Building connections and getting our educational stakeholders on board is key. We need to collaborate with our city council, with our school board, with our MLAs, with our community leaders, with our chief and council, local business leaders. We need to involve their partner groups and the community as a whole. We are just one of 60 school districts in BC and we need to be the voice of school districts in the community. Thank you. Um, well, since I've been out here campaigning, uh, I've talked to a lot of people that don't have much of a budget, so I do a lot of work myself. And the one thing I have here, I've never heard a teacher or a student or a, anybody in the public or a parent say that the school board is actually currently doing a good job. No once. I only have to hear that once or occasionally and that was on the board of education meetings. So I think it's a high time for some refreshment that there has to be. People have to be in there. We get some great candidates. Um, there has to be a, a, a new spirit 
in that uh, order of allocation, those meetings are might not be going. There's very little discussion going on. So uh, you know, it, it is too important to be to be that way. Yeah? There, has, there has to be more excitement. There has to be more spirit in there. And I can bring that to you. I've, I've, my my principles are um, for an education system that is fair and uh, accessible and of highest qualities. And I will always stay, stay to that. I will never break from that no matter what. Thank you. Why vote for me? Why vote for me?
Harbor's Anna Gruba has been in service as school trustee for 28 years. I am hoping to follow in his visionary footsteps. Both of my parents were school teachers. They met as school teachers. I'm training to become a school teacher myself. And being shadowing in the school that I've been helping in has got me so excited and so optimistic for the future and for just seeing the, the vibrancy of the students. I have seven years of elective experience. And on October 20th, I hope to be one of your five advocates. I like to use the word advocate because that's I mean, the role of a trustee. Um, education is the best investment we can make, but it's a very hard sell with our provincial government when we're up against things like public education, or against like things like healthcare when it comes to public education. All of the things we've been talking about are contingent on resourcing from the provincial government. The BC Liberals brought the bar down so low that um, the new government can easily get away with saying we're investing even with minimal increases. We need to make sure that the resources that are flowing to school boards across the province are adequate. There's a lot of obviously catching up to do. When it comes to mental health in, in, in schools, we're living in a brave new world. Our young people are having to deal with some of the um, tensions and stresses that we never had to even 10 or 15, 20 years ago. So, we need to make sure that there's resources to, to deal with those sorts of uh, things. To conclude, I want to thank our moderators um, for making the time to be here tonight. Um, thank everyone that had all the thoughtful questions and uh, all the other candidates for putting their names out there. I'm, I'm certainly jeopardizing uh, my current elected position by running for both roles, but I think the connection between the school district and the and city hall is that critical. But I was willing to take that risk. And of course, I want to thank everyone that's attended tonight. You're obviously people that are engaged in the political process. And uh, I would just uh, encourage you to you know, spread what you're tonight, try to talk to at least 10 people and over the next 10 days to go over here. Thank you. I need to stand to Chair's card. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, just for moderating. Thank you for organizing the forum tonight. I think we should start with that. Uh, you know, when you grow up in the heart of the North Shore, like my wife and I both did, uh, I realize any success I've had in life is because, in large part, to a strong, publicly funded education system, staff by dedicated teachers. That's what propelled me to where I was able to pursue post-secondary education in my business and my law degree. I've taken that skill and I've applied it to public service for quite a few decades. I was a school trustee for eight years. I was on the TRU Foundation for nine years, where we raised literally millions of dollars for deserving students. Education informs a passion in me because I understand that's what helps everyone in this society. That's how we get ahead in society when kids have opportunities. And it's incumbent upon all of us. It's just so vitally important for a functioning, modern, fair society to give kids those kinds of options. If you don't give them those options, we go into a downward spiral. I see that happen south of the border. The rich districts have the rich school, the poor districts have the poor school. We have an equality in this, in this city. I would think anyone, if you go to bbcnews.com and look up how Canada became an education superpower, that informs you should be glad we came to school taxes. That's what keeps this economy going. That's what makes this place go forward. That's what makes us, gives us our core values as Canadians. And so this is something I have a deep passion for, something I'm going to dedicate myself to, which is why I thought I'm going to work Thank you. Thank you again for coming out tonight. This is again for Chris. Um, you know, I'm going to make this quick. For me, I've been in the area, I've come from Clearwater, I work with Sun Peaks, and now I'm in North Town. I've been in this area for 36 years, uh, and not just here in this district. Uh, I've got two young children, the second one is just coming into the system, like I mentioned before. And, uh, you know, I'm here today, I'm invested. Um, this is my second, second term. Uh, I feel like I've learned a lot in the last four years, a lot of my first experience, and, um, you know, I understand the importance of education. And, um, I'll just leave it at that, I guess. But the um, you know, biggest thing I wanted to make sure uh, last one is that you may not you know, agree with all of our opinions, obviously maybe one half of us, so that works, but um, uh, uh, when you go out to leave here, make sure you just pass the message, get people involved, get them educated. Again, I think that's the biggest uh, challenge we have as trustees, is letting people know, and not necessarily what's right or wrong, but just know what it is to be a trustee and how it impacts um, the city and how it impacts our kids. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, candidates, for coming. And thank you for coming. Don't forget, Tuesday, October 16th, 7 p.m., Henry Group Center. You can ask all of our questions. And uh, don't forget to vote on the 20th of October.
Thanks.